I, I have dreamed of having the opportunity to do this for so many years. I just thought it would be so much fun to have a diorama of Westford where you could build the buildings and move them and you know all the dynamism that's happened in this uh, space in the last uh, 275 years. And then voila, um, Yvonne Lee, who is a Westford Academy graduate, uh, actually created this. And wonderful Sandy Shepard from Westford um, built all the buildings to scale, to fit onto this, um, to this spot. And so they really made this possible. I just get to move things around. Um, I'd love to have this interactive because I see people here who know so much about Westford history and you know, correct me when I'm wrong, ask questions, please be involved in this as we um, create Westford uh, together over the next, the next hour. Um, everything that I have learned about Westford history, and Mike and I have been here 50 years this spring and that's just so hard for me to believe, um, I have learned because of the incredible sources that this town has of written history um, that people were so good about recording and we have and it's in this building and for those who are watching at home we are in the Westford Museum at 2 Boston Road which you will meet during this presentation. Um, we have Hodgman's history from 1883 which is just an astounding amount of uh, facts and figures up to that point. We have memoirs from Kate Hamlin, who was born in the tavern right across the street from where we are, and her recollection of what Westford was like as in her childhood. That you can buy a copy of here in the bookstore. Um, Fred Fisher, who was just a few years younger than Kate, did the same thing. He lived on Depot Street. All of these give us, they bring everybody who lived here to life. They're not just buildings of Kate's memories, and I'll share some of those with you, really let you know who the people were who lived here. It was a good group. You're gonna really, you're gonna like to meet them. Um, and then we have the maps, uh, four or five different maps of Westford at different times that show the houses and who lived in them. That's an extraordinary resource for us. And probably um, saving the best till last within the last decade, although it probably took him longer than that to compile, um, Bob Oliphant published his Westford Gazetteer. And in that, and these are also available here, any place name that you find in any source in Westford history from Hodgman forward, um, Bob tells you its provenance, where it came from, why it's called that, where it is, and where you can find it. It's a fabulous, fabulous book. I just keep it by my bedside. And every now and then I just open, you know, let, let's do the G's. Uh, it's, 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 it's just so much fun. So, you know, all of those things you too can just pick up and, and, and learn from. So we must go back uh, to the early 1700s. And uh, this section of the world was in fact the West Precinct of Chelmsford. There was no Westford, Massachusetts at that point in time. Not many residences, probably maybe 20 or 25 farms scattered around. And in about the 1710s, 1720s, Westford started to say to Chelmsford, um, that's a long way to go to the meeting house every Sunday morning. And that was what you had to do every Sunday. Um, we'd like to become our own town. Westford uh, was told, the to be Westford, Chelmsford said that they did not deem Westford capable, that's the verb that was used, <laughs> capable of being a town. So that lingered on for a little while. Finally, the town petitioned the great and general court of Massachusetts to become the a town of Westford. And before you could become a town in Massachusetts in the early 1700s, you had to have two things. You had to have a meeting house and you had to have, you had to call a minister. So as early as 1721, hoping that sometime Chelmsford would see, get the wisdom to decide that they were capable, Westford built its meeting house. And it's pretty much as far as we know about where the current meeting house is. So we will put it right here. We're still not a town yet, but we're gonna do that. And they called um, Willard Hall, the Reverend Willard Hall um, from uh, at, at all of the ministers at that point came from Harvard College um, and he came out to Westford. So we had everything that we needed. And in seven, seven, September of 1729, ta-da, we were officially the town of Westford. 
And there were not many buildings around that meeting house. There were just one down here on Main Street and another one further down. But it was a pretty lonely spot. But we're going to change all of that. Um, soon thereafter, the town decided that they would purchase this triangle in the middle, and this really almost is the physical geographical center of the town of Westford. They bought it from Joseph Underwood, and they bought it to be a training field for the militia to train. Um, some people say it was used for grazing animals, but we have never seen any written documentation of that from that time, but we do know that it was used as a training field. Probably one of the earliest houses that was built nearby was the uh, house that became the John Abbott House. It wasn't built by Mr. Abbott, and it sits where the Northern Bank and Trust is now, so we'll put Mr. Abbott's house right there. So there's the neighborhood, pretty, 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 <laughs> pretty small. Uh, soon thereafter, the tavern was built at the, uh, right across at the triangle. There was no triangle there, but it is now. So that is now the, um, it, that's called the Fletcher Tavern. The date on the house is 1713. It hasn't been documented that it's quite that early, but it certainly is an 18th century house. So it would have been there very soon thereafter. Now, our meeting house, we grew. Um, those 24 families, um, actually there were 76 men on the, on the uh, landowners on the list of how many people lived in Westford when we became a town. But that grew and we outgrew our meeting house. So not the first time Westford started recycling buildings. <laughs> and this building was moved to Chelmsford, who had use for it. We, it was the Baptist Church, I believe, mm -hmm. in uh, South Chelmsford. And uh, so it moved, and we built ourselves a new, larger meeting house. Um, but that only lasted until uh, 1793. And we'll use this one as the second one, but this is sort of my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, flames consumed the second meeting house. But within two years, we built ourselves a new one. And it's the building that you see there today. That building was built in 1794, the same year this building was built. But it wasn't built facing the common, as it is now. Fire doesn't come back for a little while. It was built facing down Main Street, and the door was on the side, because that was facing south. So that allowed the sun to come in those beautiful, beautiful windows that now face the library. The sun all came through there. So our third meeting house and the current meeting house um, live there. Now most of the education of these few children that lived here, many of them were lived on farms and education was not a huge import to their families. They wanted large numbers of children to keep the farm going. But certainly people were educated in the home. And then very, not very soon uh, thereafter, uh, there was, in the, in, into the 18th century, um, into the 1800s, there was a small schoolhouse built, and it literally sat right in the front yard of the tavern. It was right across the street from where we are right now here. So that was the center school at that particular point in time. And that's when this became, um, well, 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 we'll rename it in a minute. We have one other school that we need to build. The same year that we became a town, that we built the church, a group of men, sorry, but it was, all men, got together and decided that Westford needed a place to um, educate people beyond the elementary level. And that's when they founded the Westford Academy in 1792. And within two years, they had acquired land across the common from the meeting house, and they built the very first Westford Academy, the building you're sitting in now. But it was built over here, next door to the, um, uh, where Jean and Jen Roberts live now. And there's a wonderful painting of it in its original site, which hangs on the wall right behind you. And that shows it on that location. Um, so that's Hilda Street that's coming in front of that building, not Boston Road. That's that building in that original location. Um, at, so at that time, that the uh, is this the Hamlin house? Yes. So Mr. Hamlin built the house next door. So that's number one, Hildreth Street. So we've now 
we've just gotten into 1800. That was 1794. These houses were built in about 1803, 1804. So they decided now, because there were schools, two schools there, they call this section of Boston Road became School Street. Now some of the maps show School Street, in fact, going all the way down to Minot's Corner, but um, research we've done recently indicates that the Boston Road, in fact, went, um, started at the Common, and School Street was probably just that small section because it housed both Westford Academy as well as the Little Elementary School. Yeah? I thought that the Academy faced School Street because there's a, the, the, the step is there. I'm having trouble doing that in terms of where the Hamlins are because I'm not sure this corner is exactly right. If you see that picture there, it does have it exactly like this. Yeah. And the original step is on that site. If you go over there, there's a huge granite step. That is the original step for Westford Academy. And it was um, moved back there on the 1929, it must have been the 150th birthday of the uh, academy that they, they and it's carved. It says this is the original site of Westford Academy. So I think I think Bob is right. The problem is is that's not quite the orientation of the Hamlin's house, but this is where you have to use your creative minds. All right here. The photograph behind you, Alan? Yes. Yes, that's the that's the one that the painting was made. That's great because that shows the triangle. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, as I look around here, I think it's all right here. All I have to do is, <laughs> it's wonderful. It's great. Um, I did forget to tell you, for when the second meeting house was there, it did not have a beautiful steeple like this with a bell in it. So in fact, there was a separate little building that was called the Belfry. No bats, <laughs> just the Belfry. Um, and it was actually, we think it was across the street from the church. Um, and it was probably taken down when this church was built and did have a bell tower and a bell in it. But I'll just leave the little belfry there for a moment so that you can appreciate how cute it was. I'm sure it was gone by the time um, the academy was built because I don't, we don't have no evidence that they share that, they share that particular site. Um, so these people obviously now were beginning to become a community. They had their meeting house and uh, the very first of the general stores in Westwood Center uh, was built. And it was built down at number 40 Main Street. This is not it. It was a smaller store than this. It was called the Red Store. But I'll just give you an idea. We'll build this one in a few years. Um, but that's 1813. And it was Benjamin Neal's Little Red Store. I read an interesting account when I was reading with Kate Hamlin uh, tonight before I came over. And Kate says that most of the exchanges in the general store were by barter. These people were farmers. They didn't have cash. So they would trade, you know, a dozen eggs or um, a calf or something with a, with a brochure. And I had read that before, but that was interesting to reread because we were definitely a rural economy. Um, there were two things in the early early 1800s that really put Westford on the map in terms of our agriculture, and one was apples. Behind all of these houses, and you can see this on the 1886 lithograph, um, back behind the town hall, 40 acres of, of uh, apples. Behind uh, Sherman D. Dewey's house, all apples and blackberries. They were known as the, the blackberry, the home of the blackberry. Um, and those were shipped into Boston by wagon um, on a daily basis. That was, our, that was our economy for sure. Now all did not go perfectly well um, with, the, uh, the, with the meeting house. There was a schism in 1829 and uh, William Channing was the person who was discussing the question of the Trinitarian versus the Unitarian Church. And so the liberal constituency stayed where they were on the, the uh, meeting house but 75% of the members of the church left, and they wandered themselves across the common, and they bought a parcel of land right next to where we are sitting right now, and they built themselves their own Orthodox church. It, it didn't have the spire yet, but Sandy didn't make us the little one. Um, so we now had two churches facing each other on Westford Academy, on Westford Common, um, the Unitarian and the Trinitarian Church uh, facing each other. And that part of the place is more. We won't put the crosswalk in, but yeah. <laughs> so just as there was one uh, general store in, um, in 1839, Sherman Dewey Fletcher 
uh, bought the old Little Red store, and he tore that down, and he built the store that's there now, uh, which became the Wright and Fletcher store. His partner was Mr. Nathan Wright. And, <laughs> sure. When you say 75% left, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Uh, about about a hundred families um, were there all together, and seventy five families left. Yeah, the list of who came and went is actually in Hodgman's history, and George Downey, who was the minister at the first parish for many many years, um, the father of the librarian, Alan Randall, is uh, wrote a history of the first parish, and that also uh, describes exactly how that happened. What George doesn't mention is the. Um, uh, theology involved in it. He talks about the numbers, but he doesn't. He talks very little about Trinitarianism and Unitarianism and William Channing. Um, <laughs> you can find a lot of that in other sources. So it was a big thing, and um, we'll get them back together. So don't lose hope. But for the <laughs> but for the moment, they are apart. So Mr. Fletcher built his store here, but we were growing enough that there was a need for more than one store in Western Center. So. J. John Bateman Fletcher built himself a house on Lincoln Street, but it wasn't Lincoln yet because Mr. Lincoln wasn't our president yet because this is 1848. So Bob and I were discussing earlier, we don't know what that little section was called before it became Lincoln Street. But he started as a farmer because he had 40 acres behind his house of apples and um, soon decided that actually he wanted to be a shopkeeper. So he built himself a house a store right next door, which you know that today is Ed Collins Insurance Office, but at that point it was the J.B. Fletcher store. So we've got the Wright and Fletcher store, we have the J.B. Fletcher store, and during the, when the uh, Democrats were in the White House, this was the post office. And when the Republicans were in the White House, <laughs> that was the post office. <laughs> Very good. So um, there was a third general store at Westford Common. I mean, isn't that incredible? You know, they're, they don't have anything now, but then they had all of this. So in, um, there was a little store next door to where the library is now. It was called Peter Swallow's store. And Peter Swallow came from Dunstable, specifically so his daughter Ellen could attend Westford Academy. She was a very, very bright young woman. And Dunstable did not have a high school that went beyond eighth grade. Ellen Swallow went on to attend Vassar College, be the first woman admitted to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she taught for her entire life. And she created what we would call home economics, but it was much more than that. It was really the science of um, keeping a healthy home. Things like if you take the rugs outside and you shake them every now and then, things might be healthier inside. A lot of cooking things. She had a, um, a, at the Chicago Exposition in 1897, she had a kitchen there where she cooked healthy food that she explained to housewives how to cook health, healthily. And this woman graduated from this building in uh, 1852. And that's why Peter Swallow came to town and opened his, uh, and opened his store. Okay. Now, there were other buildings now being built beyond the church. Uh, David Butterfield had a tavern. And by that, it probably was very much where people went um, when it was halftime at the church service, because you went in both <laughs> the morning and the evening, not to drink. It was to get a little bit of food. So David Butterfield had his tavern there, just about where uh, Canal Drive is today. And um, other houses that appeared along the way was the Bancroft Wright House, which stood right smack dab there. And then at the very same time, another of the houses that appeared, Dr. Benjamin Osgood, had his house across the street from there, next to the Fletcher store. So the neighborhood was sort of picking up here. The things, were, um, things were moving right along for Westford. And one of the other occupations was um, there was a a uh, blacksmith shop, and that stood literally behind the First Parish Church, just about where we're sitting right this very minute. And uh, hanging right above me is a picture of this uh, same blacksmith shop that stood at this particular, at this particular location. Um, 
So this is when Westford really and Westford Center changes because of um, a new awareness of the import of community and also a new influx of money. And um, that came from the creation of the Abbott Worsted Company. The Abbott family, you can't talk about Westford Center without talking about the Abbott family. The first Abbott came here from uh, Bill Ricca in 1716 when we were still at Chelmsford. And like all of them, he was named John. It just would have been so much easier <laughs> for historians. But he was, he was Deacon John. And um, he had Captain John. And Captain John actually lived in a house Captain John moved in to um, this house. He bought it. He did not build it, but Captain John lived there. And then Captain John's son, John, <laughs> John, um, John W. P. Abbott, uh, partnered with a gentleman by the name of Charles Grandison Sargent, who had come to Graniteville to start the C.G. Granite uh, Sargent Company. They made machinery for the textile industry, which was just starting to flourish over in Lowell. We're now in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. So John Abbott asked if he could rent part of the mill building down in uh, Graniteville. It's the part the roof has collapsed now, actually, 12 North Main Street. And uh, he wanted to start a, a manufacturing there of yarns. And these were yarns that were used not only for knitting, but they were largely for carpets. Um, in terms of interior design, property was just becoming a very good thing. And their largest customer was the Bigger Carpet Company, which was just down um, in Clinton, in Clinton, Massachusetts. So with the emergence of the Abbott Worcester Company came sort of a new wealth and also a community awareness and a group called the Westford um, Ornamental Tree Association was established, and they set out the trees on Westford Common. So let's set out a few trees on Westford Common. And they also, Mr. John Abbott, went to the town and asked for permission to fence the common. And the town report says that he may do so as long as it is at his own expense. And so John Abbott, as one of many, many contributions that the Abbots made, put out the, um, uh, put out the trees and the fence around the common. And then soon thereafter, uh, at the start of the Civil War, um, the flagpole was put up to bid farewell to the soldiers who were leaving for the Civil War in 1861. It was cut down on, from the forest on Forge Village Road, the uh, Oscar Spalding Forest, uh, brought up to Westford and planted as a flagpole. And soon thereafter, the bandstand um, was built around it. It didn't have the green tent then, but it, the bandstand did go onto the common. And this is the wonderful photograph that also hangs in this building that um, was discovered when the common restoration was happening of the bandstand as it looked in the late 1800s. And this, the 25 or 30 students who are around it, is the entire student population of Westford Academy and the two faculty. That's the all of Westford Academy. So what they had done to have this picture taken was they simply had walked out of Westford Academy and walked across the common. They had their picture taken on the bandstand. And uh, Gordon Seavey talks about how that was the Right there are in the playground that all the students would come out to the common because there was no other land around the academy to, uh, to entertain them. So at about this time, so, so let us build, um, the trains are now coming to Westford because of this new industry that is coming. C.G. Sargent's needed transportation. Uh, Abbott Worcester needed train, uh, transportation. So the first of our eight train stations were built and we became, it became Depot Street from here on down, because this led down to the depot where Stony Brook is. Let me introduce you to a lots of the abbots here. So how can we do this in the proper order? Yeah, we'll do this. So um, there was a house. Uh, John Abbott lived next door to his father, John Abbott. <laughs> and he lived in this house. 
should sort of show you these before I put them up, because this house still exists, but not where it was, of course, because that's how Westford did things at that point in time. Okay. So John W. Pitt Abbott, who lived in this house and was the one who started the Abbott Worsted Company, um, decided that he would upgrade. And so he moved across the street when the Butterfield Tavern was very badly damaged by fire. And um, he bought that building. And there's a question of whether this was totally destroyed or whether it was just badly damaged and he rebuilt it. But if you look at the picture side by side, it just very much looks like the footprint. It looks like the old house reconfigured, but with a Belvedere. And it was, it was far more elegant. And that stood where Canal Drive is. Um, oh, wait, oh, wait, I missed a golden opportunity. Hold on. There was a fire yeah. <laughs> in the Butterfield Tavern. And as a result of that, J. John W. P. built his house, or restored the house, that was across the street. So at that point in time, uh, this house was moved, chugga, 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 right over next door to the general store, where it still sits. It's the two-family house that's right there that is the uh, number 36 Main Street. So that house is still there. And to keep things moving here, in its place, um, oh, we have to move one more house. Okay. So when, when Squire Abbott died, he left his house to his son, John W.P. But he also left the house, a lifetime occupancy, to his housekeeper, Rachel Blood. He said she could live there um, for the rest of her life. And that Rachel Blood did for another 17 years. So John W.P., as a wedding gift, gave his son, John, <laughs> the house that his grandfather had lived in. But it came with Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> so he couldn't do anything with it until Rachel's death. They were very, it was, they were very good friends. It was just, you know, she kept living. <laughs> so on her death, when Rachel died, John William Abbott picked up his grandfather's house. And he moved it down Boston Road, where it still stands. It's the second to last house on the left before you get down to the orchard. And it's still there. I think it was just sold again last summer. We can't put it quite far enough down Boston Road. But you notice that we've relocated a lot of buildings here. Yeah. And because things had picked up in the um, Abbott family, because of the Abbott Worcester, when John William, who became president of that, when his father handed him the reins at age 21, he was a man of quite substantial wealth. So he built what the family, um, how should I say this, um, humbly called the mansion. <laughs> this was the Abbott Mansion. And it stood right here. And soon thereafter, he built for himself a windmill, which stood behind. He had a well house in front. And the windmill pumped water to the attic of the house where there was a huge copper holding tank. And that provided enough water pressure that the Abbots had indoor plumbing when the rest of us in Westford were still going out <laughs> and pumping things by hand. Now, Mr. Abbott had decided to partner with the younger Abbott, John, with a gentleman by the name of Alan Cameron, who had immigrated here from Scotland. His family had been in the wool industry, so he was very knowledgeable about worsted wool, which is what the Abbott specialized in. And so Alan bought from the Abbotts the lot next door to them, the next house down. At one point, the Abbott family owned all of Main Street on both sides from the common all the way down to Flag Road, with the exception of two properties. So they could sort of build as they wanted. So they sold that property to Alan Cameron. Alan Cameron actually and his wife had lived in this house for a while after John moved out and moved into his fancy house. But now it was gone. So there was an extra lot next door. And Alan Cameron built this house next door to his good friend, John Abbott. They were business partners. They were best friends. And uh, there was another connection that we will get to in just a very moment. So you can see the Abbots are sort of quietly eating up Main Street. 
but their, their generosity and what they were giving to this town was um, extraordinary. And um, one of them was the clock in the church tower was a gift of John Abbott. And the clock, oh, we don't have the rodent bush yet. I can't tell you about that. It'll get here. <laughs> so um, the town now is growing in terms of its, uh, its size. Um, and so we are outgrowing the meeting house because that is where we've been doing town business. It is still where town meeting is held. It is where the town offices, as they were, most of the offices were actually in the homes of the people who were the selectmen and the town clerk and the treasurer. But now the town was substantial enough that it really did need a town hall. And so the town took land by eminent domain from Dr. Osgood's widow, and they built the town hall in 1870. Dr. Osgood's widow said, I don't believe you paid me exactly what that land was worth. And the town said, oh, of course we did, widow Osgood. We would never do that to you. The courts ruled to the contrary. <laughs> and the town had to pay Mrs. Osgood a little bit more money for the land that the town took by eminent domain in order to build that. Only 10 years later, they decided that they had outgrown the town hall. And so they put a whole section on the front. As you walk into the town hall now, where the stairs go up, that's, that was the 1880 edition. And the tablet that sits at the top of those stairs, that beautiful tablet, 1870, remember this was built, that tablet lists all of the men from Westford who went to the Civil War, which had ended only five years before. So that's why that tablet is in that building. They moved that up to the second floor, which must have been quite a task. They made it a little bit bigger in the back, and the whole second floor was, uh, was open space. It's where the Grange met. It's where Westford Academy graduation was held. It was where dances were held. There were no offices up there. It was, it was entirely, it was a meeting place. So we now have ourselves a town hall, and we have ourselves a place for it to have parties. So by now, the way that Westford Center looks is very, very similar to the way that it was captured when a company from New York made this lithograph, a bird's eye view of Westford Center as it appeared in 1886. And these are for sale. I have one in my office and I can't live without it because I just, it's just so much fun to see it. And you'll be able to come over after the talk and look there and you'll be able to find all of those buildings that you and I have built in the last 100 years um, as they were here on the top of Prospect Hill. But that wasn't the end of, of Westford's growth. Um, because the money is still uh, there from the Abbott Worcester Company, just to give you an impact of how important this was to this town, um, by the early part of the 1900s, I believe it was by 1920, 40% um, of the people in Westford who were employed were employed by the Abbott Worcester Company. We were a company town. Um, the villagers lived in Forge and Graniteville, and not unlike so many other towns, the mill owners lived on the hill. And um, that did cause, there's no question about it, there was a, there was a we and a they. Um, but also, when you talk to people who knew the Abbots, they were very good stewards, and they provided the housing at very low cost, and um, th 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 it, was a, it was a good mill. Meltown, but I'm, I'm a little bit biased about that. Um, the money continued to be paid out from this, uh, this wealth that was acquired. And in 1893, I had mentioned that the Abbots and the Camerons had become very good friends. Uh, in 1893, Julian Cameron married Lucy Abbott, his next door neighbor. They had grown up next door to each other all their lives. And as a wedding present, Daddy Abbott, gave them number seven Graniteville Road, which you may know is the Palian's house. It's now Sue and Rob Scott's house, and it will be on the house tour on uh, June 10th, as a matter of fact. Um, so, and they also had a windmill, but we didn't. Well, let's just borrow one. Hold on. May we take your windmill, Mr. Abbott, and give it to your son? So when this house was built in 1893, that house also had a windmill. We know that there were 13 windmills altogether in Westford. Some of them were on farms but most of them were in the center and were signs of affluence that you could afford to have indoor plumbing when the rest of us didn't. The next generation of Abbott, um, John's youngest brother, was named Abile Abbott. And he lived 
with his mother, his widowed mother, in this house, um, the Abbott House, where Canal Drive is now. And on her death, um, when he and his wife were no longer living with it, he decided it was time to make his mark on Westford Center on land that the Abbots, of course, owned. So he built the house that Penny was telling you about where the reception will be on Thursday the 8th, which is the Abile Abbott House that sits right at the intersection of, let's move people down here a little bit, where Graniteville Road, then call, called Haywood Road, heads off down to the stone quarries and down to Graniteville. So that is where Abile and his wife lived. And then their son, Edward Abbott, who was the last Abbott to be president of the Abbott Worsted Company, also lived there. Um, and his wife, Natalie, uh, died there in 1983. And uh, we were able, I was involved in a League of Women Voters history project where we interviewed a lot of these wonderful people. And Mrs. Abbott had lived almost all her life next to the, um, the Wright and Fletcher store. And she has this wonderful quote where she says, well, the little store next door was an institution. You could get everything from ice cream cones to corsets. <laughs> like, what else does one need in life? <laughs> so Mr. Cameron had also done quite well. And his house had been left on his death in 1900, because we've now dipped into uh, the, the, the 20th century. A Biles house was built 1891, 1892. But by 1900, Alan Cameron died. and. Um, uh, his wife, who was 25 years younger, had predeceased him. He left his house not to his son, but to his daughter-in-law. That's a story I've always wanted to know more about. <laughs> but in any event, his son, uh, they lived in it together. They were already uh, lived in a house next door to the Rodenbush Community Center, which I have to build for you here in a second. Um, and they were really living in North Chelmsford, so they only used it as a summer home. But in 1914, in order to get the breezes and make it a summer home, they added the porch that is on the house now and changed the roof line a little bit. So the Cameron house became more like what we see it today when the porches were added in, uh, in 1914. So just as the town hall was built and it was time for the town to think about some of these services that were being added, the town had a library. The library had, in fact, been established the same year that the meeting house was established, built, and the Westford Academy was built. But it was in people's homes. It was a social library, and it sort of rotated in different people's homes. But by 1895, the town was thinking about buying, building a building that would be the library. When they built the town hall, there was a room in the town hall for the library, but it was but one room. And now it was growing. So serendipitously for the town, but not for the Bancroft Wrights, the Bancroft Wright house burned down in 1893, leaving this lovely piece of land right on the common where the town thought it would be perfect to build a library. So they went to town meeting in 1894. 1895, actually. And um, just as the town, the moderator had read the motion and they were about to vote on it, the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, our old friend Sherman Dewey Fletcher from the Dwight and Fletcher General Store, said he had a letter he wanted to read to the town meeting. And he read a letter from J. Varnum Fletcher, who had grown up in Westford, uh, had a house that was right at the corner of where Depot Street takes that sharp turn to the right um, before you go across the tracks. And in it, J. Varnum Fletcher said, I have always wanted to do something for the town I love so much. And therefore, I would like to buy, pay all the money for the library. Um, do not bother to appropriate $10,000, which was a lot of money in 1895. I will pick up the tab. Town meeting accepted his kind offer. <laughs> One of the stipulations was that he got to choose the color, which is why it's that color brick, because nothing else in the center was brick. But J. Varnum Fletcher gave the money, so he got to pick the color. And it was dedicated in 1895. And they obviously called it the J.V. Fletcher Library in his honor. And uh, the final cost actually ended up being $15,000. And he continued to pay all the bills in spite of the fact that it went a little bit over budget. Um, at the same time, just a couple of years, the next year in 1896, the members of the what was now called the Congregational Church decided that they wanted to make their church larger. And uh, Charles L. Hildreth 
who lived on what is now Hildreth Street, because there are so many Hildreths there, Pleasant's gone, um, offered to, to pay a substantial amount of that uh, bill. And that is when the, uh, the spire was added, before it was a very simple little church. And so that's when that tower was added. So as soon as construction finished on the library, construction began on the new church. And as soon as that ended, the Westford Academy trustees decided that they had outgrown the original 1897 building, and it was time to build a new building for them. Alan Cameron had bought property on this corner, and he donated that to the trustees. And on that, they built what we now know as the Rodenbush Community Center, but this was the second Westford Academy. Interestingly enough, the same architect designed the library and the community center. The library is so simple and square. No, this had gargoyles. So. <laughs> and it's just, it was an architect from uh, Fitchburg named H.M. Uh, Francis. And uh, so we then had a large driveway that went in to the Rodenbush, what was then the Westward Academy. And so that left us with two Westward Academies. So what to do with the other building was the question. Oh, in 1895, for some reason, town meeting decided that they didn't need the fence anymore. So we will, it didn't burn. I can't do the drama here, but it, it was that. Um, and so we are now at 1897. And the uh, next thing that happened, and this was again when Sherman Fletcher was uh, was the chairman of the board of uh, selectmen. He went to go see the man who had been the principal, the preceptor at Western Academy. He taught Ellen Swallow. John Long was his name. John Long went on to become governor of Massachusetts, and then he became uh, undersecretary of what probably was called war, probably at that particular time in 1898. Yeah. Secretary of the Navy. Secretary of the Navy. Thank you, Bob. He was Secretary of the Navy. So Sherman went down to Washington to visit with him and said, we would like something in Westford that was a symbol to the youth of America about um, the horrors of war. We had just finished the Spanish-American War. And uh, John Long said, well, I happen to have a cannon in the basement <laughs> <laughs> that was captured at Santiago. And um, if Westford will pay the freight, uh, we can ship it up to Westford. So the cannon came to Westford. It arrived on graduation day in June of 1899. And it was located right at the point of the common with the cannonballs, which you will note don't fit. <laughs> <laughs> and that was intentional, because there was a large disclaimer that the town of Westford had to sign that said that they acknowledged that the United States government had no responsibility if the cannon was ever fired. <laughs> so that was, that was put into the records. Um, education is now appearing. Um, the smaller schools are now, there were, there were 10 local schools. The one we know, eight of those 10 buildings are still standing in Westford. The one that we know the best is the wonderful Parkerville School because it's used as a living history school for um, the Westford children. But there were 10 of those all in the different neighborhoods in Westford. But in, uh, 19, in the early 1900s, the school board decided that they should be consolidated just for efficiency and for, for educational efficiency and for cost. So the first of the larger schools that was built was the Frost School, which was built on the other side of the Rosenbush property. In between them was a large swamp. <laughs> I haven't gotten the grant yet from the gift from Mrs. Whitney to fill that in yet. Um, William Frost was the principal, the preceptor at Westford Academy. He died at the school um, in 1904. So when the Frost was built, um, they named that for, the, um, for Mr. Frost. And at the same time when the Cameron was built, it was named for this Alan Cameron, who had died in 1900. It was the first time the town had named schools for people. They'd named, uh, maybe they sort of got on a roll after the J.B. Fletcher Library. But this looks good on a building. Perhaps, perhaps we can do more than one so we have basically built the center, and now you begin to see a change because the industry that was, I have to turn the church because Mr. Abbott did that in the 1890s, and I just forgot to do that. So it sits where we do today. 
there, we may have done that when his daughter was married. I'm not quite sure. But, um, and as, it's fun, actually, because if you stand in the, at the library and look over to the long side of the church, you can see where the doorway used to be in that side. The, the clavers just don't quite line up quite right. So you can see how it was when it was oriented toward the, toward the street. Um, so Westford was still doing very well, was very, very affluent, but you began to see some changes that were going to be coming. Um, Abbott Mill was still doing well, but it was not quite as, as lucrative as it had been. Um, many of the mills were moving south, and for the first time there was actually a strike at the Abbott Mills in about 1920. I understand it was devastating to John Abbott, it just never occurred to him that you know, they thought they were such good stewards. They were actually um, organizers who came from Lowell to try and get the westward workers to strike. Um, but there was, a, there was a shutdown of the Abbott Mill for at least a day. And that was, that was sort of the, the chink in the armor you know, about, about what was coming. And there were some other changes that happened. The um, Abbott family, uh, well, let's see if I can get this right. In, in uh, 1941, um, John Jack, he was called Jack Abbott, the last generation of Abbotts, um, had died. And his wife moved back to where she had come from in, in, um, in not Brookline, Belmont. And so the house sat empty. And it was rented for a while to the Red Cross. and. It was rented to a summer theater in the, in the 1920s. Um, and then it was sold in 1940. And it was taken down. It was dismantled. It was just taken down by someone who wanted to use the property. So this beautiful house that had only been built in, uh, in 1879 only had a life expectancy of about 60 years. And it was torn down. Um, for the moment, there was nothing that was put there, the, the land sat vacant for a little while, but that was sort of a symbol. Um, and then in 1914, actually, the um, beautiful Abbott homestead that stood across the street from the mansion had burned. The Abbots were no longer living there. Senator Fisher was living there. So that left that land all of a sudden left <coughs> in another gap, sort of a little hole in our landscape. And in the 1955, the Cannell family bought that property and put in Cannell Drive, which was right across the street there. And that was the first new street that had gone on in Westford Center since it had been established in 1729. And the Cannells built the houses there in the 1950s. And in 1956, the mills closed. The Abbott Worcester Company sold the company, and it moved. And that was, nobody really quite expected it yet. And although Courier came in as a printing company and occupied them, they didn't employ as many people as the Abbott Worcester had. Um, it's also very symbolic of what was coming in terms of the new technology. Many of those people took jobs with Raytheon. So you see the change here. You know, Route 128 was called the industrial, the electronic way or something. Technology. technology. You know, all of the. Um, um, Technology companies were moving to Massachusetts, and that was the writing on the wall. And the other thing that happened was that Route 495 came up and came through Westford, and that also changed our complexion. But we hadn't given up on moving things and doing some things that we wanted, <laughs> we wanted to do. Um, in, uh, in 1907, um, the, the, uh, the original Westford Academy was just sitting idle, and so it was sold. And it was moved, of course, across the street to where we are right now. And at that point, Mr. Blacksmith shop was moved as well. And it went down Leland Street. And it now sits as a part of the last house on the left before you get to Providence Road. It wasn't quite this big, so it's down here somewhere. So we did that. And being the resourceful people that we are, um, we decided that the perfect thing to do with an 18, 1797 schoolhouse was to make it into a fire station. <laughs> <laughs> and there are great pictures right there on the wall. You can see they just cut three doors right in front of the building. And there the fire engines uh, uh, lived right, right where you're sitting, Bay 1, <laughs> Bay 2, Bay, Bay 3, which was the way that we did things in that particular era. Um, 
Uh, another change to the neighborhood that's now happening now that we've got Canal Drive there. In 1960, the old schoolhouse, which at that point was vacant, it hadn't been used for a schoolhouse, it was being used as an apartment building. That was also taken down. I have such a hard time envisioning what it was like to have the tavern with a two-story, you know, real honest mm -hmm. school in front of it. But that was taken down. <laughs> and then some changes that we know now um, began to happen. Uh, where the, where the, uh, where the mansion had been and had been dismantled in 1941. Um, it sat empty for almost 20 years, but then the post office was built, the Westford Center Post Office, left the general office <coughs> for the first time, and we built ourselves a real honest to us. I think it's time to move our belfry as much as I can to do that, but it wasn't there in that particular time. Now, there was a, a, once a very small building uh, that was built in the 1930s, um, J. Herbert Fletcher, who was the, the grandson of the Fletcher, for whom he had built this fancy other half of the house because he could live there. Sorry, I forgot to put that house there, which is now at Conley's and, and uh, Gail's house. Um, Mr. Uh, he, he was the right party, so he was a Democrat, so he was the postmaster. Um, but he decided that what he really liked to do was to be a postmaster, but he had no interest in running the store anymore. So he uh, sold the store to Austin Fletcher um, in the 1920s, and Austin ran the store there, so it still remained the Fletcher store. It was very convenient. They didn't have to change the sign. And um, J. Herbert built a very small building right next door just a second. Right between the Fletcher store, the Fletcher house, and the Osgood house. It was a very small little building. It was still there in 1967, uh, empty, because the post office had opened in 65. So he just ran the post office. That's what he was. He was the postmaster then. Um, he didn't run the general store anymore. He did that um, for that period of time. So. In 1971, the town decided it was time to move the fire station from this building. That's pretty astounding that this was a fire station until 1971. <laughs> anyway, so they wanted to build a new fire station, so they bought Dr. Osgood's house. At that point, it was called the Sullivan House. And um, they tore it down in January of 1971. They bulldozed it. So this one didn't, it disappeared, but it did not burn. And in its place, they built the new fire station, which is now about to be the old fire station. But that went right there, right next to the town hall, pretty much almost connected to it right, at that particular point in time. Yep. And obviously, Mr. Swallow's store has long gone. It was torn down in the 19, well, not long gone. It was torn down in the 1960s, in the early 1960s. And that little cape that's next door to the library that was built next door. And so the fire department was expanding, and they needed more room. And then the trustees of the J.V. Fletcher Library, who were an elected board, decided it was time to uh, perhaps add on to uh, J.V. Fletcher's library. They had added on once before. There was a children's room that had been added on the back of the building. And the lovely part about this is that the money for that was given by a woman by the name of Marion Winnick. And she was the granddaughter, great-granddaughter, great-granddaughter of uh, J.B. Uh, Fletcher. So she continued the Fletcher generosity. Um, but the town had outgrown that. So what they did um, in uh, 1970, 1989 was to put wings on either side of the, I wonder if I have these on the right side. So that got larger. And then we grew again. And it was time to, between the town hall and the new and the new station, there was, a, there was a police station that was just one story that went between the two buildings. And so that was torn down, and a very fancy new police station was added in 1995 with a courtyard in between. And that's the courtyard where the um, September 11th memorial was put um, on the 10th anniversary of, 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 that, uh, of that event. And then the most recent one has been, oops, if that wasn't, I think I just put the church on the, I did, I just built a church on the, sorry, that was the addition of the church. This is the police station. Never thought how much they look sort of alike. I apologize. We built a police station. And soon thereafter, the first parish, which has been obviously growing all this time, although since it was built in 1794, we added 
a Catholic church. And then uh, down in Forge Village, there was a, an offshoot of the Episcopal Church uh, found, uh, sponsored by the, in, in Ayer and Groton um, that had a connection with the Groton School. Um, and so we, there were other churches other than just the Meeting House, and it wasn't the Meeting House anymore. But it was time for the church to expand. They still had, um, your concern about the division of the church, we can bring those back together here. In the 19, late 40s and early 50s, um, the two churches realized that financially they simply could not survive to support both the buildings. So it took a long time. And a gentleman by the name of Herford Elliott, I believe, was the person who really was the glue that brought the two congregations together because there were lots of theological and other differences. But by 1955, the two congregations agreed to come back together as the first parish church united. And this became, continued to be the church. And this became the parish house, the parish hall, where they had um, the church suppers, the Sunday school was held there. But the church was concerned, especially about the traffic of the children walking back and forth from the church to the Sunday school. So for many reasons, they decided that they would try and put on an addition. And from a very generous uh, donation of Gordon B. Seavey, who had grown up um, pumping the organ for that church as a child, um, they were able to add on, actually only the first part first, and then the middle part came a little bit later to put the addition on to there. And this building was sold to the Historical Society, the same people who are responsible for this building. Um, and they lease it out to a, a nonprofit called the Parish Center for the Arts, who runs concerts and, and, um, and all of that. So all of a sudden, from 1719, when we weren't capable of being a town, Look how capable we have become, because we have grown into this amazing town of, of uh, 22,000 people, still governed by the town meeting that first met in March of 1730, and we'll be meeting again in March of 2017 to carry on that tradition. Um, and with that, I welcome your questions and your, and your comments.